Bibles to Matthew chapter number 21. This morning, we are finishing up uh, in a real sense our series on intimacy. The last six weeks, we've had, I think, a wonderful, wonderful series of preaching and teaching. Pastor Teddy, Pastor Donna, myself uh, have really been working to try and give us uh, a wonderful kind of breath and depth, uh, uh, exhausting reflection and teaching on intimacy, uh, intimacy with God, intimacy with others, even intimacy with yourselves. And uh, this will be kind of our final Sunday where we'll uh, be spending time on this. I encourage you all to go to our YouTube channel. If you missed any of the Sundays or you want to review or remember what we've talked about, it'll be a great opportunity for you to do so. Uh, here as we move into the book of uh, Matthew chapter number 21, uh, just to give you some background, for many of you that may not uh, know much about the book of Matthew, Matthew uh, is one of the three similar Gospels uh, in the New Testament. It was written uh, by an eyewitness account, disciple of Jesus, by the name of Matthew. And uh, Matthew was certainly uh, someone who had a very checkered past. Uh, if you look into the, the history of Matthew, you see that Matthew was one of these folk who was actually on the wrong side of the Jewish uh, working class. He was a tax collector. And uh, if you know anything about tax collectors, uh, they were some of the most despised Jewish folk of their day. Uh, they were uh, folk who were actually uh, responsible for being agents of the Roman Empire. So they were criticized uh, and thought uh, very critically of by their Jewish uh, counterparts or, or, or colleagues, if you will, because they worked for the enemy. And not only did they work for the enemy, but they, in many respects, used their position as a tax collector to uh, extort many of the Jewish folk as well. Uh, they used the threat of the Roman guards to uh, add a little bit more on top of their taxes. And uh, it caused great consternation and great conflict, so much so uh, that the tax collectors were deeply despised. So when uh, Matthew became a follower of Jesus, uh, I'm sure Matthew had a good little uh, history that he had to overcome. Folk would see Matthew and they would remember that he was a tax collector. And uh, it just continues to remind me of how wonderful it is that we serve a God who uh, always gives us a chance to reinvent ourselves. Uh, somebody say amen to that. Amen. Amen. Some of us, amen, uh, uh, should be glad that uh, when, 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 when we come into relationship with Jesus, he washes our sins away. Amen. He sings a song says, I got a new name. Amen. And, 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 you know, some of us are glad about that because uh, not everybody knows your new name. So they still calling the old one. Amen. And can't find you nowhere. Uh, that God really, in many respects, gives you and I a whole new identity. Uh, how many know not everybody appreciates that? And uh, this is one of the great gifts, I think, of the gospel that God continues to give us chances to make up for lost time, if you will. Uh, Matthew then writes this gospel with a particular audience in mind, and it is the Jewish audience. Matthew wants to express to all of his Jewish readers that Jesus is the fulfillment of Jewish prophecy. Uh, so Matthew uses many of the Old Testament prophecies uh, in his uh, letter, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, to reinforce that indeed Jesus is fulfilling much of the Jewish expectation for a Messiah. In this way then, let us turn our attention to Matthew 21 verse 1 and let us read about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. <coughs> when they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them. Everybody say that, the Lord needs them. 
and he will send them immediately. And this took place to fulfill that which had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut branches from the trees, spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he'd entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? Crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to spend a few moments, amen, for uh, today's teaching and preaching time on the topic, sacrificial living. Certainly, as we continue this series on intimacy, what does it mean for us as an outgrowth of our intimate relationship with God to live sacrificially? Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God. That has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. That rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I must live sacrificially. Come on, say that. I must live. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Now, Many of us that are in relationships with people of significant intimacy uh, would certainly realize that the deeper intimate relationship you have, the more you are called or must be willing to sacrifice. That you're just not in an intimate relationship with folk and it does not require some kind of willing giving up of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm by myself, Pastor Mike. I can't deal, right? But the more you get into an intimate relationship with someone, how many of you know that it requires some sacrifice? It don't require you to give up everything, but you got to be willing to give up some things. And that sacrifice is often not uh, uh, like determined from the beginning. That you may go into a situation feel like I'm going to give up this, but I'm not going to give up that. And that thing you're not willing to give up may actually be the thing that may be the make or break in your relationship. That this relationship, this level of intimacy, this idea that God is calling for us to live our lives in such a way where we are willing to let go of some things that you should not hold so dear or near to you. That you must be willing to consider and reconsider some assumptions you may have. That in many respects, intimacy requires a certain level of asking, reflecting, Hmm, what must I give up in order for this to really work? I find that being in a relationship with God is so powerful precisely because God does not start from your level of sacrifice to determine how much God is willing to sacrifice. But God demonstrates his depth of sacrifice and invites you and I to live out of his sacrificial gift. And then in return, our level of intimacy with God deepens. It is the case that God says that I love you so much that I'm willing to give up whatever privilege, status, and power I have to make sure that I can be in relationship with you. 
thought starts there. Amen. God don't say, well, let me see how much my bride's going to love me, and that'll determine how much I love him back. How many have been in a relationship with folk like that, right? It's like, you know, well, I love you as much as you love me, and when you stop loving me, I'm not going to love you no more. And it's quiet in here today. Amen. Amen. I don't mean no harm. Amen. So like, and that's, that sounds like me. Amen. Uh, but, but, but God does not make his love or his sacrifice or even the depth of his intimacy conditional upon ours. But God is all in from the beginning. How many are glad that God is all in from the beginning? Amen. I mean, all in, like everything. Push it to the center of the table and say, I'm going to go all in in this relationship. Now, what is so fascinating about our relationship with God and the depth of our intimacy with God is I find that the more in tune and intimate I am with God, the more I'm willing to sacrifice on God's behalf. But if I'm not that deep in with God, and when God asks me to do things that are unreasonable, I'm kind of like, what you talking about, Willis? You must not understand, God, what I'm dealing with. When God asks me to uh, go back and forgive or ask for forgiveness, it's like, well, God, don't you know what they did to me? Mm, I don't know, God. I mean, that's not, you know, that, that's going to make me look kind of crazy. Or if you have these moments where you are stretched beyond your capacity and you are finding yourself not as intimately connected to God, and God asks you to do something that seems unreasonable. You won't respond with an intimate connection to God, but you will respond with your own reasoning and your own thought process. Child of God, I want to submit to you today that the more intimate you are with God, the easier it is to let some of this stuff go. Now, you know, I said easier. I didn't say easy. Let me know it ain't going to never be easy for some of us. Amen. There are some situations where it's not going to be easy. Do I have an honest church today that'll say there are some situations, Pastor, where fasting and praying is never going to make this easy? Hmm? But thank God that easy is not the prerequisite for intimacy, it's easier. That the more you get intimate with God, the easier it will become for you to do the things that make God and yourself happy. I was talking with a friend of mine and, you know, this kind of conversation about how, you know, the trouble that's happening in their life, they feel like God is punishing them. And then don't suggest that God does not, you know, discipline those whom he loves, because certainly the scripture says so. And at the same time, I often question how often what is happening to us is a direct result of God's discipline or are not following the ways of God. Because how many of you know when you follow the ways of God, the scripture says they are life to you. But then when you don't follow the ways of God, conversely, they are death, destruction. In many respects, my brother and my sister, it is not as if God is sitting up in heaven with a fly swatter or some kind of like disciplined gun waiting for you to step out of line so he can zing you back in the line. Could it be that sometimes when I get out of the path of God, then I get into the way of trouble? But when I get back in the path of God, then life is mine. Good things are mine. That is why following the ways of God uh, don't just benefit God. But how many of you know they benefit you? They benefit me. That when we follow God's ways, God gets us and helps us to get to the place where you and I want and need to be. And it is in this way that I find the biblical text and particularly the life of Jesus to be such a gift to us because we see through the life of Jesus constant decisions being made by Christ to follow the path that God has set out for him. 
And all through the life of Jesus, you find there are moments in Jesus' life where he has to make sure his intimate connection with God is secure, is getting the proper attention. Because how many of you know that intimacy with no time or attention is not intimacy at all? I don't know what it is. It's just a mess waiting to happen. But Jesus, even in the midst of all of his divine, eternal work, still always found time to connect with the Father. Because Jesus understood that in order for me to do this God work, this sacred work, this divine work, I got to be connected to God. I got to be connected to the sacred. I got to be connected to the divine. And in your life and in my life, there is often a tension between who and how intimate we are with God, others, and even ourselves. Because there are always things pulling and tugging at us. But I want to declare and decree to you today that in this story we see Jesus moving through the final days of his life on earth. And he is, in many respects, giving you and I clear examples of what intimacy with God looks like in the world. I want to submit to you today that there are some moments in this week, dare I say this whole Lenten season, where there should be a very rigorous reflection about your level of intimacy with God. Don't just go through the motions, but go deep. Challenge yourself to ask the kinds of questions that get you a different kind of answer and reflect on how intimate am I with God. In this regard, sacrificial living requires some principles from this text that I think will help us uh, to take very seriously uh, this notion of intimacy through sacrificial living. In verse uh, number eight, we see Jesus uh, unleashing his disciples or sending his disciples in the first few verses to go to the village ahead and find a donkey, a colt, if you will, two animals that will be used by Jesus in the service of his final acts of revelation ministry to the world. And I think one of the first principles that we find in this text that I want to lift up to you today that should be a reflection of our sacrificial living as an outgrowth of our intimacy with God is are you available to live sacrificially? Are you available? Everybody holler availability, availability, availability. Now, again, you see Jesus telling his disciples, go. And then you see Jesus also saying to them, when you go, you're going to find these animals that don't belong to you, and you should get them too. Jesus is assuming a whole lot of availability. Jesus is sending his disciples to go. It's kind of like, go. Uh, I, I tell you, I, I'm getting ready to make a trip, so I need a couple of y'all to go out there, and you're going to find a car. And, 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 and it's not my car, and it's not your car, but you're going to find a car. And when you find a car, get in the car. And if the owner come and ask you, what you doing in my car? You tell them the Lord has need of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Some of y'all, you know, it's like, yeah, I know a few folks in the joint who, 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 who said the same thing, right? It's like, I, I needed this car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were, in many respect, you know, being told by Jews to go in donkey jack, right? Just go in car, just take a, just... Just do it. And what's so fascinating about the disciples? I mean, I think they've been with Jesus for a minute. So they were used to Jesus telling them to do some weird, crazy things. Uh, but their intimacy, their proximity to Jesus gave them the faith and the courage and the obedience to do this thing which seemed unreasonable. And I find that when God asks of me things that are unreasonable, how 
intimate I am with him will often determine my answer. If I'm not prayed up and God asks me to do something that's outside of my comfort zone, I'm like, I don't know, God. This, 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 I can't do this. Mm-hmm. Any, any, anyone else in here that's ever felt like that? God asked you to do something. You're like, what? That can't be God. Praying in the middle of the night? That can't be God. Forgiving? No, no, they, no, no, no. But, but then when you get closer to God, you'll find yourself. God, whatever you ask me to do, I'll do it. Are you available that when God tells you to go, you're willing to go? And not go begrudgingly and kicking stuff on the way. I can't stand this. You find a lot of examples in scripture of how a few folk said yes to God, but they said yes with a bad attitude. Uh, I, I can think of I can think of Jonah. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah like Nineveh. Them folk killed my people. I'm not going there. So Jonah ended up running from God. We all know the story. Ended up in a fish, a big old fish that God created for Jonah. Uh, ain't that something? God will create a situation for you where you would only be you and God. And you and God will get that intimacy thing worked out. It's like, now when you was around everybody else, you couldn't figure it out. Then you get real close proximity with God. Anybody ever been in a situation where it was nobody else but you and God? <clears throat> you know, some of us get sick and we in a hospital and we can't call nobody. It's just God. Some of us go to jail and we in jail. Our rehab program or we, we, we at home by ourselves. God knows how to allow isolation to deepen our intimacy. And then when you get in that situation, you're like, oh, yes, God. Oh, no, now I remember what you were saying. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I will do it. Thank you for the reminder. And then you go and do the thing. I tell folk all the time, if God got an assignment for you, you can't outrun God's assignment. Wouldn't it be something if, if the disciples told Jesus, Jesus, we ain't going to do that. Man, you always got us do crazy stuff all the time. Nah, 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 nah. C couldn't you imagine how this triumphal entry may have played itself out differently? That in many respects, the disciples' availability allowed Jesus to enter into a space where another opportunity for his revelation his self-revelation to people could be known. There's a lot depending on our availability as followers of Jesus. God wants to reveal God's self to you. The question is, how available are you for that? Are your priorities not in the right place? Are you available to everyone else but God? Are you Are available to everything else but God? You're available to go to everywhere else but God. Well, the moment God asks you to do something, you got a conflict. How many you know in the Bay Area we say time is what? Money. Amen. We we all, you know, man, I got the we got, you know, we we got we we, we all got a little bit of time. YOLO, you only live once. I got I got I gotta do I gotta make the most of my life. Can't be can't be all tied up with this God thing. But I found it. God can redeem the time and make your time even more valuable. My brother, my sister, the question of, for us today, one of the questions is how available are you to God? If you are available, you can live more sacrificial. If you're not available, you will find it hard to live sacrificially and certainly in an intimate relationship with God. Because intimacy not only requires time, but it requires your availability. Second thing that I think is wonderfully given to us in this passage is found in verse number eight. As they are riding into the town, the scripture says a very large crowd gathers and they take off their 
coats, their outer garments, and they lay them on the road. This was a very normal practice for the entrance of royalty and kings. It was, in many respects, them paying homage to the greatness of that person which is coming. And in many respects, I also want to suggest that it is also a test, a question, an inquiry for all of us as it relates to how will we live sacrificially? Are you willing to throw off some of your stuff? How much of your garments, of your clothing, those things you use to cover yourself, are you willing to throw off as a result of your intimacy with God and, dare I say, even other people? Throwing off your garments. Throwing off those things that we use to cover ourselves. How many of you know that when you're not in a deep relationship of intimacy with God or with other people, you use a whole lot of things to cover yourself because you don't want to let everybody see your business. How many of you know Jesus can see your business whether you covered or not? Amen. A lot of us we more concerned with other people. I see folk all the time, neighborhood young people all the time, and they will see me walking up on them, and they hide and stuff, you know. Well, hey, you, just, you know, you ain't got to be worried about McBride. I, you know, I'm really nobody for you to be all that preoccupied about. No pastor, I just don't mean no disrespect. I say, hey, now, you know, God was standing right next to you before I showed up, and God will be going when I leave. So if you and God is cool with you, puff, puff, pass, and all the other stuff, then don't be, don't, don't be hiding because of McBride. Praise God. Uh, you're like, well, you know, you cussing like a sailor, and then I, show, I walk up, be like, ooh, you know, like, listen. You know, again, it's not me. Jesus said it like this, you ought not fear the one who can destroy the body, but the one who can destroy the body and the soul. And I got newsflash for you. I ain't trying to destroy either one of them. All right? So, you know, I'm the least of your concern. But it ain't something that we like to cover ourselves up. We don't want people. I mean, this is a natural thing. When you're on your first date, you don't tell everybody the worst things about yourself. At least I hope you don't. You know, you're on first date. You know what? I'm just a very selfish person. I hope you call me next week. You know, it's like. Probably not, you know. You don't want to be looking like you do in the morning, some of us, when you out, you know. You know, you, we cover ourselves. But how many know the deeper, like, you know, me and my wife, we've been married for some 20 years. No, I'm sorry, some six, seven years, praise the Lord. I know, six years, I know. It's six going into seven, you know, and we and are on the way to our seventh year. And, uh, but how many of you know that our level of intimacy certainly is different because we see each other in the morning, like when I rise. And, and, and it used to not be that way, you know, uh, that certainly we only saw each other at our best. But our intimacy, certainly through marriage, has now created this space where we are literally see each other at our worst emotionally, psychologically physically, mentally. We see each other at our worst because our intimacy has gotten us to that place. You ought to be so intimate with God that you are not actively trying to hide things from God as if God does not know it already. I feel sorry for the child of God that feels the need to try to lie to God. You know? You know, like you 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 trying to like you, 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 you doing a shake move on God, you know, like, you know, you, you know, trying to dodge God. God, was, you know, before Superman had x-ray, God had x-ray. Man, God can see through all of our stuff. And when you get to a place in your relationship with God where you can tell God the truth about what you're struggling with. Tell God the truth about who and where you are. Not get so hung up on the labels and the categories and the identities that we use to try to cover ourselves. In our culture, we are 
constantly using labels and identities and money and relationships, even our fear and our doubt. But as Jesus makes this triumphant entry into our lives, I hear him saying to some of us, what are you willing to throw off? So you can be transparent before me. What are you willing to let go of? So you can be transparent before me. What are you willing to give up? So you can be transparent before me. What is so wonderful about being honest with God is that you actually create the space for God to work willfully, willingly, voluntarily in your life. Tell me, you know, God does not force God's self into places where you do not willingly open up. Some of us have a lot of fears and a lot of inhibitions and a lot of concerns and a lot of places in our lives where we're just not transparent. We're not willing to throw these things off and let God have God's way. Some of us feel like, man, I tried that, McBride. It, don't, it just stayed the same. I want to submit to you that sometimes it's a continual process of opening and surrendering, transparently putting yourself before God. What are you willing to give up? In this last week of Lent, this last week of approaching the moment of resurrection, are there some things in your life that you realize today, I need to, I need to give up. I need to let God in. I'm, 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 I'm seeing him come. He's making this entry. He's trying to get into this place in my life, but I'm holding on to some stuff. Rather than throwing it on, listen, some of this stuff God can handle if we would just throw it off. How many have burdens in your life that you know you can't carry, but you know God can? So why do we hold on to that stuff? Rather than just give it to God. It is almost as if, you know, how many of you ever tried to pick up something and it was so heavy that your back almost just kind of separated your, itself from your torso? Man, you just like, you know, you, you, you know, uh, try to pick up something so heavy, you know, you just couldn't do it. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Hey Amen. I remember one time we was moving, we was moving uh, this organ around here in the church one time. And, and, you know, we had a bunch of the brothers here and, you know, two of us was trying to do it and, 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 and we couldn't figure it out. You know, we thought we was he man, not he man, but he man. And, uh, it didn't work out. So we had a bunch of the other brothers come. Hey, I don't know if you ever had a little kid come and, you know, you got all the big guys picking it up and all of a sudden, you know, you have someone, a little person come on, they put their hand on and they acting like they really like carrying it. It's like, man, you ain't doing nothing. It's just the rest of us. How many of you know that? That's how it is with God. God is carrying all of our burdens and we just touching it, you know. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Oh, I can't handle it. Can I? God is like, wait a minute. Just because it's touching you and you touching it, don't mean you carrying it. God says, I got this. Get out the way. Some of us need to get out the way and let God carry our stuff. But you got to be willing to let it go. And we want to throw it off. If you're intimately connected to God, you will find it easier to let things go. But if you're not, it will be easier to hold on to it. And I, again, find that when I'm holding on to stuff I can't carry, it wears me out. It causes me immense struggle. I'm a child of God, let's, let's let our intimacy drive the depth and the ability for us to be sacrificially living. And it is in this way I believe this week can continue to be a moment for all of us 
to not only, as the scripture says, suffer with him, but we will also reign, experience the victory with him as well. Stand with me, everyone, as we prepare to pray.